Welcome to worship with First Grapevine, a United Methodist Church. We're glad you have chosen to worship with us. Please take a moment and let us know you are watching by registering on our church website, firstgrapevine.org, or on our mobile app. Today, we continue our sermon series entitled The Jesus Project. This month's emphasis in the series is Face Your Demons, with a message by Associate Pastor Carly Payne, music by Josh Ingram and the Holy Rollers, and Jason Chavaria and Hannah Howell. Thank you for joining us. We hope this time will be a blessing. And now, let's begin our worship. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. We are glad you chose to be with us here at First Grapevine. Before we go any further, I want to encourage you, if you've got something on your heart, something on your mind that you would like to tell us about, send us an email now. Go ahead and give us a call. We are here for you. Before we continue with our worship, let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for this technology that allows us to stay connected no matter where we are, no matter when we are choosing to watch. We ask that you bless this time, be present with us, and help us to grow in our understanding of you and who you are calling us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I get lost in my mistakes But it looks to me like a weakness Is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does
Good morning, boys and girls. Miss Carmen here, and I'm so grateful to be back with you. I've got a great story to tell you about some fishermen, and their names were Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and they were brothers. And they had uh, some friends named James and John, and they went out fishing, and they loved to fish, and they fished all night, and they were so hopeful they were going to fill their nets. The next morning, they had caught nothing, absolutely nothing. And as you can tell, there's the empty net, and there's the moon, and they worked really hard. And the next day, I mean, as they came into shore, they saw a man talking to people on the shore. So as they pulled their boats in, uh, the gentleman said, may I use your boat to speak to this group? And Simon Peter kind of looked at him and said, okay. And he really didn't know who he was. So after the man had spoken, and we know that was Jesus, he turned to Simon Peter and said, put down your nets. And Simon Peter said, thank you, but we've been working all night and we've caught nothing. And Jesus said, put down your nets. And they did. And guess what? If you don't know the story, well, all the fish came. And if there were so many fish, it filled up the boat once they pulled the nets in. So the men were astonished and they found out it was Jesus. And Jesus turned to them and he said, I no longer want you to fish for fish but to fish for men. And what he also said is, follow me. Now, they didn't truly understand all of that, but they had the understanding and faith that this man is going to show them more, show them their hope that they had hoped for, and they did. So that's what we are to do. Just like I'm doing right now, I am sort of like a fisherman. And what I'm doing is retelling the stories of Jesus, and you can do the same. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for everyone watching, and thank you for our precious church and country. And may we just continue to pray and be hopeful and do what we know to do through your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, we come to that time whereby we express our thanks uh, as well as the challenge of uh, receiving gifts for ministry and supporting ministry in and through uh, First Grapevine. Uh, last year in December, I went, uh, our church sponsors a Christmas party at La Juntas, a uh, little Methodist church there that we're in partnership with. Uh, and we do a Christmas party for all the children there. It's a street storefront church on one of the streets there in the community. Uh, when we went in, of course, we went early and we got to buy all the decorations and be a part of setting up for the party. And then finally the big night of the party came. They had a clown there. It was just festive. And uh, certainly the celebration of the birth of uh, baby Jesus was center. Uh, in the life of those families that gathered. The place was packed, high energy and singing and fun. At the end of the uh, program, they had me come up as the pastor of our church, and as they did, they shared with me this gift. And it uh, give, was given to us that night as we were there, and you can see it's got our name across the top. And then it also has uh, all the handprints of the children. Uh, I don't even have the words to describe what that was like for me as the children came up and began to thank me in Spanish. And back in those days, we could touch. <laughs> and I was just mobbed. It was a memorable night because God was present and ministry through the church was done. You see, my friends, that's what this giving part of the service is about. It's about us receiving more than we can ever comprehend or understand and then being the vessel and instrument through which we're motivated by God's love and abundance that we share it with others so that they too know and experience it in a way that makes a difference in their own lives. I pray not only for you as you give during this time, but also 
as you realize what God will do with what you give. May we always realize that whatever the gift is in the hands and heart of God is expanded in ways that really are indescribable. Let us go to God in a time of prayer. Oh God, there is so much in our lives, as a matter of fact, to be real frank and authentic with you today here, Lord, there's too much. Too much pandemic. Too much suffering. Too much death. Too much anger. Too much hate. And we sometimes get overwhelmed with it and anxious and even frightened by its presence in our lives. And yet, even as we own that and we confess it to you here today, we are reminded, Lord, that we are your children and we live in a family relationship with you and you are the God of abundance. You are the God of intimate loving. You are the God that would lay and leave the 99 to go find the one. You are the God of risk. And there's not a place that you won't go with your loving for any one of us. Oh, Lord, may that be from the place in which we live our lives in the midst of the too much of the other. And may we find the comfort and the strength and, yes, even the wonder and the beauty of who you are. May we be able, oh God, to look through that lens so that even as we do, we begin to interpret all the other in a way, oh God, that doesn't sell our souls. In a way, oh God, that transforms even the worst of what we see into the beauty that only you can bring. For the cross and the empty tomb are, are symbols of that, Lord. And may we be those kinds of people. And may we continue to reach beyond ourselves regardless of what circumstances life may bring to us that we might reach beyond to, to be in partnership and loving in the world as the children in Lahuntas know. And as these handprints on this cloth remind us of the great need of such love. So, Lord, give us a sense of that here today. We pray for them. We pray for those on the front lines. We pray for those, oh God, who have been stricken by the illness. We pray for those families who have an empty place around the table because of it. We pray for a transition in power across our nation today. And this week. And we pray, oh God, that you will be a part of that, that you will be in the midst of it, and that you will bring healing to our land, conversation to the divisions. We give ourselves to you in this worship service as we always do. Do with us as you will, Lord. And may we once again move beyond what we see to what we feel and sense that we too might be a part of your loving that indeed makes the difference. We give ourselves in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who lived such a life and who lived such love and who taught us and teaches us how to pray as he used the great tool of prayer in his own life, as we share the words together, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us not our trespasses as we forgive those, O God, who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, in the north city wall, is a pool with the Aramaic name Bethsaida. It had five covered porches, and a crowd of people who were sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed sat there. A certain man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knowing that he had already been there a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I don't have anyone who can put me in the water when it is stirred up. When I'm trying to get to it, someone else has gotten in ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately the man was well, and he picked up his mat and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. You aren't allowed to carry your mat. He answered, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. They inquired, Who is this man who said to you, Pick it up and walk? The man who had been cured didn't know who it was because Jesus had slipped away from the crowd gathered there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said, See, you have been made well. Don't sin anymore in case something worse happens to you. The man went and proclaimed to the Jewish leaders that Jesus was the man who had made him well. As a result, the Jewish leaders were harassing Jesus since he had done these things on the Sabbath. Jesus replied, My father is still working, and I am working too. For this reason, the Jewish leaders wanted even more to kill him, not only because he was doing away with the Sabbath, but also because he called God his own father, thereby making himself equal with God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe
Is traveling in Jerusalem when he comes across Bethsaida, a place with pools where people gather who are sick, lame, or blind who want to be healed. He comes across a man and approaches him and who's laying on a mat and he asks him, do you want to be healed? Instead of answering him directly, the man gives the excuse that anytime the waters are stirred up, someone beats him to it. Jesus looks at him and says, pick up your mat and walk. And the man does. And it's a miracle. But it's a miracle that begs the question of us. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? This seems like a ridiculous question that Jesus asks the sick man. If I'm being honest, it almost sounds like an offensive question. The idea that the man who's been sitting by the healing waters trying to get in for a long time wouldn't want to be healed seems preposterous. Yet, it's a question that Jesus asks him. And it's a question posed to us to wrestle with today. I'll admit to you that I've got about five different starts to this sermon. As I read the passage over and over, new questions began to pop up. I would notice something different in the story. Where's the demon? Why couldn't the man get to the water? Why didn't Jesus wait until sundown to heal him? It seemed like the more I dug into the questions, the more questions I had. And I imagine you have your own as well. And one thing I can promise you is that I won't answer all of them. In fact, I might answer none of them. But together, I think we can uncover what this passage has to say to us today. This month, we're talking about demons those things that have control over our life in a negative way. And it's tricky to talk about because we look at the biblical stories and we see mental and physical illnesses characterized as demons. And because we have the medical terminology to explain these things today, it can be tempting to pretend like demons don't exist anymore. The truth is it's a lot easier to think that than face the reality that there are still things that control us. It's much more pleasant than looking at my own greed or jealousy, my addictions, or those things that hold on to me. But this sermon isn't about demons, at least I hope it's not. Because when we look at the scripture, the story is about healing. And if demons are the things that control us on one side of the coin, then healing is what we're looking for. Jesus is in Jerusalem when he comes to this pool called Bethsaida. It's an area where people would gather who were sick, paralyzed, and blind, where they would gather for healing. It's a large area with five porches. And they would wait by the water. And when it was stirred up by an angel or spirit, they would rush to the water to be healed. And out of the crowd, Jesus zeroes in on this nameless man and asks him the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? 
The man doesn't answer Jesus, but replies that every time the waters are stirred, someone gets in the water ahead of me. He gives an excuse. I imagine him groaning as he tells Jesus, there's no way I can be healed. This man has been at it for a long time with no luck. And then I imagine Jesus looking him in the eye as he says, pick up your mat and walk. And much to the man's surprise, he's able to do just that. For the first time in 38 years, this man is made well. It's then revealed to us that this happened on the Sabbath day, a time when work is not to be done. And so this man who had wanted to carry his mat for almost 40 years gets questioned because of the day he does it. When they ask who healed him on the Sabbath, the man doesn't know because Jesus has already slipped back into the crowd. Later, the story ends with the religious authorities harassing Jesus for saying, I'm still working because my father is working, equating himself with God. What do we make of this story? How do we wrap our minds around not only what happened in the scripture, but what it means for us? I think that for that man, as well as the religious authorities, their idea of healing had been kept inside a box. When the man answered that he had no one to put him in the water, he wasn't saying he didn't want to be healed. It was just he had no concept that healing could occur any other way. When the religious authorities questioned Jesus, it was outside the realm of possibility that something like this could be permissible on the Sabbath. Both parties missed the point. Healing was not going to come from their willpower or their might. The healing that man was in need of was from a God who works in mysterious ways. A God who with the command of his voice can heal someone from their sickness to make them pick up their mat and walk. And I think there's a message for us in there as well. Maybe many of us are looking for healing in the wrong places. Maybe we do want to be healed, but what we're trying isn't getting us anywhere. And don't hear me say that you're not praying enough or that doing enough, because what I'm trying to say is that it's not your own actions that's going to get you anywhere. What I'm trying to say is that God is the one doing the healing work. And it's our job to look outside the box of what we think, where we think, and how we think healing should come. And it's in those moments that Christ comes and looks us in the eye and tells us to pick up our mat and walk. So this week, I invite you to think about where we've put up blinders to God being at work in our lives. What is the demon that controls you that you've given up on? Where do you believe you're so broken that you can't be fixed? It's in these places, in these cracks of who we are that God shows up to transform our pain into beauty. So when we're asked the question, do you want to be healed? Maybe our, our answer should simply be, Yes. Amen. Welcome back for the conversation portion of the message. And you just heard from Pastor Carly. Uh, we also have Pastor Travis here with us. Uh, I want to go straight to you. Uh, is there anything else, anything that you didn't put out there in your message that you want to add about this scripture? Well, I think, and I kind of alluded to it, It just like we wrestle with the concept of demons and facing your demons, what that looks like, I think we also wrestle with the concept of healing uh, and what that looks like. And that's a tricky thing to address. In, or it's a tricky thing to talk about um, what does healing mean, especially when uh, we see 
we hear stories of people being miraculously healed and then we hear stories of people who don't get healed uh, in the way that we expect them to be. Uh, so it's a tricky thing to talk about. Yeah. And I, I had to kind of laugh when I asked you that question because I asked Carly that right before we started recording and she goes, nope. So yeah. you did good. Yeah, Thanks. that was good. Thanks. Appreciate uh, it. Travis, what jumps out at you about this this story? Well, I mean, it's like most stories in the scripture. Uh, you know, God is the author and does it work through Jesus? And, you know, there's, uh, it's just, it's like Carly said, it's just, there's, it doesn't follow really a pattern. Um, it happens. I mean, the question that Jesus asked the man is just a, I mean, the guy's been here for 38 years. You know, he, he, you would think he wants to get healed, and that's the question Jesus asked him. Do you want to be healed? Uh, wow. What a, I mean, that's a hard question for somebody that's sick and has been sick for 38 years. And that's how Jesus kind of begins the conversation. So, you know, and I think it gets down to where Jesus' perspective is just one that that cuts through the barriers that we have in our lives that many times we're not even aware of. Um, there was a reason he asked this man that question. Do you want to be healed? You know, and you, you, then the story follows because you get on to the fact that the man didn't answer the question. He gives the excuse why he did get healed and can mm -hmm. get healed. And when I read that, I think of... This man's tired. He's been sick for 38 years, and he it's not that he doesn't want to be healed. It's that he's exhausted his resources trying to do so, so he's kind of given up the fact that he, the possibility is still there mm -hmm. is how I read it. Oh, I think you're right, Carly. I mean, but I think that's why Jesus asked the question, mm -hmm. to stir, to have him go deep, to stir whatever it was that got him to that pool the first day. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't that happen to us all? I mean, think about the pandemic. I mean, Laura and I had this conversation in our home yesterday. We're exhausted. We are absolutely exhausted. Our child has suffered. You know, everybody's suffering. And you just get to a point when that dominates to where you lose your sense of other things that, many of which are more important than a pandemic. Mm -hmm. and I, that, that may be what Jesus was after when he asked him the question. And maybe that's the so. question he's asked us. You know, do you, you really want to get through this? I mean, if so, what, I mean, what are you doing? Or what, where is, go, not what are you doing, as you clearly pointed out, but that's not really the right question. The right question is, what is God doing? Yeah. And that's a different question. Well, a couple of couple of comments about that. We need we need God. We need that reminder of a bigger picture, of of hope that no matter how tired we feel, you know, God's love, mercy and power is is still calling us to a larger understanding and, and to a better future, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it doesn't always look like what we want it. To look like uh but god's work and grace can take us to a better take us to a better place can it, i can i throw in something random yeah. just about the scripture uh just a little bit of context this is you know doesn't necessarily have to do with the subject but in the passage that we read it says that jesus went up to jerusalem and if you're following along and you're paying attention to details jesus comes from the north and you think, why would he say up? He's coming from the north. Uh, Jerusalem is on a mountain. And so, you know, we, we say things according to a map. Like, I'm going to go down to, you know, someplace down south, or I'm going to go up according to a map. But if you're not really using maps and GPS, and you're just looking at the land in front of you, he is going up to Jerusalem. The other thing is, this pool is described with reference to the, the sheep gate, and it has five porches. This is a real place, a real location, and it's really easy to find today because you go there and you see, okay, you count them, one, two, three, four, five. 
So we know exactly where this took place. And that's true with a lot of things that happen in the Gospels. You know, there's a lot of precise direction. We're talking about a relatively small area. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you'll, you'll stand there in, in Israel. And this happens the same with the book of Acts, with Paul's travels. And you can look down and realize, I don't know if I'm right on the spot, but I'm certainly in the right neighborhood. <laughs> just want to throw that in there. That's just something I find interesting. You might not. <laughs> Looking at me as you say that. No, I think that is interesting. <laughs> I, I also, I'm thinking about my friends who are part of a church that relies heavily on prayer is a way uh, towards healing. And one of the things I like um, that they do is they never blame God for the things that are happening around them. They're not like, oh, this is a punishment from God or this is whatever. But they say, um, what's my orientation towards God? Am I thinking about, am I looking at God um, as a healing God? Am I looking towards God or am I looking at myself? And I think that's something uh, that we can take uh, we can take from them and take from the scripture is that looking towards God instead of our own willpower or our own might for healing. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Cause you're right. It, it's, and that's tough for us to hear in a very individualistic society and culture to remember to look to God's power, not, not my own sense of will and strength. Uh, I like that. I need to wrestle with that for a while. Yeah, I uh, told Carly the sermon was one for me today because I, res I wrestle with that big time. I, you know, the barriers that we construct in our lives, and all of us have them, um, we spend, you know, years putting those in place and then the way we look at our lives for good reason mm -hmm. <laughs> to protect <laughs> <laughs> you know, our vulnerability and not letting people see what's on the inside. But one of the things I think that God continually does in God's own time and God's own way is, is God is always seeking uh, in the midst of life to invite us um, to something deeper, something more authentic. Um, and I think that's, again, back to the question that Jesus was was asking him. Sometimes it's through a question. Sometimes it's through an experience. Um, you know, you have those moments where you have those epiphanies, and all of a sudden things become crystal clear, and you can you can adjust your life to move closer to God and where God's leading. And of course, those are all the experiences, you know, that we have in our journey that are the sometimes crossroads of how we travel, where we're going. There's so much to unpack with this story, mm -hmm. and there's so much going on. And something that, that always strikes me, and this is similar to a passage that we had a couple weeks ago, the religious leaders didn't celebrate healing power happening in their community. Because I mentioned we know exactly where this is. It's a short stroll from the Temple Mount, you know, from where these religious leaders were going to office every day. They would have walked by there. It's in the neighborhood. And they couldn't celebrate God's power and presence. I don't know. If that's uh, And it's quick to, I'm quick to judge them and think, well, you idiots, you know, horrible people. And then I think, yeah, that's a cautionary tale. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. When we put God in a box in terms of how healing can happen, because they're... Th they don't yeah. celebrate it because it's happening on the Sabbath, the day that they've deemed that's been deemed for rest. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that um, I noticed Jesus doesn't wait until sundown when it would have been OK to heal him. But Jesus does this intentionally uh, to, sh I think, to stretch our minds a little bit um, in terms of what healing can look like. Well, and I think, too, he blows up convention uh you know he's <laughs> he's present in a way that number one affirms who this person is and is very in touch 
with what he's sensing and seeing going on. And it doesn't matter. The clock's out the window. Because of his love for this man, mm -hmm. that's the focus. Mm -hmm. And that's what God does in our lives. And God constantly does that. You know, we have all those great stories where he leaves <laughs> the 99 safe and he goes to find the one, the return of the prodigal. I mean, all of those stories are about a God that is going to find us wherever we are. It's going to search, going to never give up. And then once that happens, it's present with us in whatever's going on in our lives. And that's what Jesus does here. And it's, it's a powerful story to read. But you're right, Grant, it's a complex story to read as well. A lot going on. And any other final thoughts, Carly? Not today. No? All right. You just looked, you know, you went from, no, I've got nothing else to say. To, uh, you looked very thoughtful there. Just want to double check. Uh, Pastor Travis, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I think I've probably said enough today. <laughs> All right. No, this is this is a fun one. And, and it's I appreciate your comments. And, and I want to chew on that some more myself. And we hope that you will as well. As always, we encourage you to join in the conversation. You can talk to us. Uh, we also want to encourage you to go and talk to other people. Share something that stuck out to you today and something that's on your mind about the way God is healing, not only in this story, but in your lives today. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. What would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song. Try not to sing out a key. Hey, I get by with a little help from my friends. I get by.
Thanks for joining us for worship wherever you are. Because you joined us, we were a little bit more complete as the body of Christ. If you're looking to learn more about the Jesus Project, you can check out our website at firstgrapevine.org slash Jesus Project. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time. For current information about the effects of COVID-19 precautions at First Grapevine Church, visit firstgrapevine.org slash COVID-19 updates.